ahead and get started. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Alex Kackner. I'm one of the uh, assistant professors at University of Kentucky. We're going to be talking about advanced laryngeal cancer this morning. Um, before we actually get started, started, um, I just wanted to take a moment to um, acknowledge over the weekend our community lost um, three uh, resident trainees. Um, I know right now it's a very complicated situation and um, it's very hard for a lot of people. So uh, just today, you know, take the time to check in with your colleagues and friends and other people in the medical profession. Um, just check in with them, make sure they're doing okay. Uh, some strategies, I know we always try to find something that we can address or fix, um, but it's sometimes good to remind yourself to do that. Eat, drink, sleep, exercise regularly, make sure you're taking breaks, checking in with people, um, acknowledge when people are afraid or if something is not how they are um, comfortable doing something, stay up to date and uh, remind yourself that you're important. So um, just something to remember today. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> getting to know your delivery guys, Tiger King. I don't know if people are watching this, but I have been. So I'm, I'm still on the fence about Carol. We have, we, have, we have thoughts about that in our house. Anyway, so let's talk about larynx cancer. Um, so th this is a cancer that's actually interestingly has been going down over the last several years. Um, about three per 100,000 uh, in men and women each year. Um, about only one death per 100,000 men and women per year and the lifetime risk of developing this kind of cancer is 0.3%. So not a huge number of our population, one of the, the, the smaller instances. However, we're still not doing a great job of getting people through this. So despite the fact that it's decreasing in incidence, our survival is about the same. It really hasn't changed. Um, and this is um, not completely up-to-date data, but up to 2016 from the SEER database. So if you look at patient survival, um, five years was when you, you know, we kind of break up with patients and let them go off to do whatever it is they want to do. Only about 60% of them are making it to five years. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. Part of it has to do with um, kind of how advanced the tumor is. And I think that speaks a lot to the patient populations that tend to present with larynx cancer. So if found early and they're localized, um, almost 80% of patients will survive to five years. However, um, as is the case with a lot of our patients here in Appalachia, oftentimes they present later. And so their survival is, uh, decrease significantly. So, you know, there are several different places that uh, laryngeal cancer can arise. Um, so superglottis, of course, is about a 35% incidence, but this is actually the most common site in women. Um, so women tend to make up a smaller portion of a lot of these laryngeal cancers. However, this is the spot that they oftentimes present in. If localized, the five-year survival rate is about 61%, with regional disease about 47%, but metastatic, it's a pretty lousy uh, prognosis, about 30%. Glottis, which is kind of the superstar of larynx cancer, tends to do a lot better, um, presents earlier, and that's part of the reasons you saw in that previous slide, um, tends to be found more commonly in men. Five-year survival, if it's localized, 83%, regional 48%, but again, metastatic is pretty abysmal. Um, subglottis is the rarest kind. Uh, it's one that we don't see super commonly. Oftentimes you'll see these um, adenoid cystic or weirder tumors in this area. Um, and that's why the numbers are sort of bizarre looking. So if you look at the regional five-year survival, it's 33%, but then the distant is 45%. And this may be due in part to the different um, pathologic subtypes. As you can imagine, someone with an adenoid cystic carcinoma compared to a squamous cell carcinoma may ultimately present with distant metastatic disease, but may be more responsive to other therapies. So that can sometimes uh, um, uh, explain that away, but I think also part of that has to do with just the low numbers. So as we know, the most common risk factors for larynx cancer are tobacco, um, a diet poor in fruits and vegetables, Beetle quid, which is more commonly seen in oral cavity, but can be seen in uh, larynx cancer as well. 
And then there are some genetic aspects as well. Um, one of the thoughts is that part of the local regional um, or the, the, the regional areas in the country where there are higher rates of larynx cancer, a lot of times are quote unquote explained away by um, smoking rates. However, there may be some component to genetic homogeneity as well. Um, if you look at the demographics for, for instance, Appalachia, the homogeneity of that population is slightly more similar than, let's say, you know, somewhere um, more diverse in urban centers. And so that may, may in part explain the slightly uh, increased susceptibility to these types of tumors. For instance, we're seeing patients as young as in their 30s with squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx, which is not very common um, in other places. So in Kentucky, about 24% of our adults and 14% of our high school students smoke. We used to be number one, but West Virginia just took the top spot. So they're at 26% in their adults and 17% in their high school, or 14% in their high school students. So I think that's actually pretty, um, pretty impressive. Uh, good job, West Virginia. Um, and then in Oklahoma, if you were wondering, um, their adult smoking rate 20% and their high school students about 12.5%. One thing that I think is actually fairly interesting, again, talking about um, regions of the country. So with regards to larynx cancer in women, again, not super common. So you see there's about uh, 2,550 diagnoses in 2019 compared to the overall number. 12,000. So the incidence rate is only about 1.3 per 100,000. But if you look at by state, so uh, uh, here in Kentucky, about 5.5 per 100,000. Um, and then comparable rates in West Virginia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And part of that, again, has to do with smoking rates. We're much more egalitarian about our smoking um, in the, these areas. Um, and then if you look at the death rates, they're about this, you know, fairly similar, but still highest in Kentucky. There we go. So there are several treatment options available for larynx cancer. Um, and, you know, part of it has to do with um, location, patient comorbidities, et cetera. But again, there are lots of different options that we have available. The question is, which is the thing that's going to uh, be oncologically sound, but also functionally sound. So for a little bit of history on your Monday morning, uh, when it was first introduced, it was not safe at all, just like most surgeries. Um, in 1851, Gurdon Buck had the first open surgery in the larynx, and Theodore Bill Roth of the famous um, abdominal and gut surgeries, he actually performed the first total laryngectomy. However, these were very morbid and very mortal procedures. Um, people died about at a rate of about 40% of the time. And this was usually because of pneumonia and sepsis. Um, again, you know, looking at the timeline there, you're looking at a time when we had no access to antibiotics and other various things that we are able to utilize nowadays. So interestingly, um, there is some uh, speculation that the larynx cancer was one of the things that actually helped spark World War I. So the Crown Prince Frederick of Germany, who was um, married to one of Queen Victoria's daughters, was actually much more of a statesman and pacifist and um, was very against uh, Germany's sort of journey towards power and accumulation of um, territories. And however, he was kind of trying to make peace with multiple different countries during his time in power. Unfortunately, he developed hoarseness and was found to have a tumor the size of a pea. Um, so his royal physician did recommend a laryngectomy for him, but he refused as he felt that that was an inappropriate treatment for him. And unfortunately, he perished from disease uh, June 15, 1888. And per some otolaryngology historians, this is what helped kind of uh, open the door for World War I. So anyway, kind of going back to advanced cancer. So which treatments do we choose and why? Um, and again, part of it has to do with where it is and how big is it? Um, again, balancing function and oncologic outcome. So with regards to the various sites, so again, that we talked about superglottic cancer seen more commonly in women. Um, the interesting part with 
superglottic cancers because they have access to the rich lymphatic supply of the neck, there is a higher risk as well for metastasis. So once you get past the, uh, the T2 stage, um, really you're starting to get more into potential for local regional spread. Um, with you know the the smaller tumors being limited to just the one subsite, and then extending you know all the way through to get to the point where it's invading into the prevertebral space, carotid artery, or mediastinal structures. So um, this is an example of um, a supraglottic gonorrhea. Um, this is a gentleman who had a tumor that was actually bursting through um, the uh, cricohyoid membrane. Um, you can see that there was extension through the skin as well. Um, and this is kind of what the tumor looked like on the inside as well. So kind of extending uh, along the um, supraglottic larynx from the retinoid cartilages into that post cricoid space. Now glottic cancer, again, like we talked about, tends to be slightly more favorable. Um, so, so, so much so that we actually divide it into much smaller categories because they oftentimes will present very early. Um, so you've got your T1, T1A, T1B, because it can involve just very small subsites of the glottis. Uh, the nice thing is because there isn't as rich of a lymphatic supply, oftentimes we can target our treatments either to minimally invasive surgery or narrow field radiation in order to preserve the surrounding structures. However, um, as you can see, glottic cancers can also turn bad, and part of it is again due to presentation access to healthcare, um, among other things. So um, subglottis, again, a rarer form, um, standard uh, staging system, again, looking at involvement of surrounding structures. Um, tend to present more with airways uh, issues, oftentimes with strider, um, and can have various pathologic subtypes. So this is one of my favorite neck staging pictures, just because it's a smiley face, meh, and then everything else is terrible. Um, this is a way you can kind of remember um, staging system, and it's a handy little picture to keep in your pocket. Um, so how do we decide? Because like we talked about before, there are lots of different options for treating larynx cancer. And so one of the seminal uh, papers, which I'm sure all of you have had to read at some point, is the VA larynx trial, which utilizes chemotherapy almost as a triage to assess which patients would ultimately respond to chemoradiation uh, at the end point. Um, what was found though is that in the long term um, it, in RTOG 9111, that there was a higher rate of organ preservation um, with concomitant therapy instead of sequential. And thus that became sort of the standard um, if you look at most of these studies, though, they did not really include a lot of advanced laryngeal cancer, um, partly because for the most part, we recommend a laryngectomy for those patients. However, if you look into this your database, you'll see that actually a lot of people are still getting concomitant chemoradiation. Um, and so that's one of the main questions that oftentimes comes up. Well, which ones can we save? Is there a potential for T3s and T4s to undergo organ preservation? Um, and the other question is, how long do these studies actually follow the patient? So what about after the cure? So we're oftentimes seeing patients five to 10 years later who um, either are having dysphagia, become trach dependent, become G-tube dependent. Um, in addition to that, there have been a handful of studies that show increased rates of pulmonary related death, um, and which is related most likely to the aspiration issues. So T4s, for the most part, if you ask most head and neck surgeons, they'll pretty much agree that a laryngectomy is going to be the way to go. However, there are some, some cases within the T3 world that you could really see oncologic outcomes that are fairly similar um, with regards to oncologic fu and functional outcomes. So, so how do I know if he needs a larry? So one option um, that we've actually looked at here at UK is the TOC score. And so what that utilizes is the T stage, the albumin uh, prior to treatment, um, liquor consumption and Karnowski score. So hopefully you will see this at a meeting coming to you unless we end up becoming a completely Zoom affiliated meeting. Um, in the Kentucky population at least, which um, 
you know, again, we have a very large number of uh, larynx cancer patients. What we found in our um, patients undergoing chemo radiation for organ preservation, our salvage rate was mostly associated with an albumin less than four. Um, and that was even when correcting for continued tobacco use, which a lot of our patients unfortunately do continue to do. So um, this may be related in part to an underlying uh, cachexia and other comorbidities. But interestingly, that was fairly predictive of failure of organ preservation. Um, this is one of the ones I use, the you had one job score. Um, so Dr. Bill Carroll at UAB you know, said, well, the, the larynx has three functions. Um, it lets the air in, it lets you talk, and it keeps you from aspirating. And so what I look at when I'm looking at a patient is I say, all right, how's your breathing? Are you somebody that is a marginal airway at best, not being able to sleep in a bed, having to be in a recliner, needs a trach, um, can't eat, aspiration on fees or modified barium swallow prior to treatment initiation, and very poor voice. So if you have two out of the three functions, that ain't bad. I mean, that, that is a functional larynx. And so typically I will give them the option of organ preservation. However, if two out of the three are missing, I usually will strongly recommend laryngectomy. And that's because from what I've seen in the literature and also in, in practice, is that if a function is missing, the likelihood of its return is fairly low when adding the chemotherapy and radiation, except for potentially airway obstruction. So um, that's one thing to consider. And again, it's, it's a very individual uh, discussion that has to happen because the laryngectomy is not a walk in the park um, for, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. However, um, one of the things that I always talk with patients about is, you know, at the end of the day, eating is one of the most social things that we do. It's one of the things that when someone comes into your home, you invite them for coffee, for cookies, whatever. And that's how pe we interact with a lot of people. And we can usually find a way to communicate, but food is one of the ways that people communicate very well. So <laughs> you have one job. Um, there are other options besides the standard um, chemotherapy and radiation and laryngectomy. There are a lot of clinical trials that are open um, of people trying different uh, biomarkers, um, immunotherapies, um, to see if there is a way to really uh, preserve the larynx in these patients. And um, so the, the, it's, it's definitely an area that's ripe for research. Um, even with our declining incidence, we still are seeing patients dying from this. So, um, you know, there, there is room for research. Now, with regards to surgical options, which is what a lot of us come to the table for. Um, so there's laser surgery, which I think someone's talking about that a little bit later um, this month. Um, partial laryngectomy, open approaches, total laryngectomy, laryngopharyngectomy, glossal laryngopharyngectomy, and then with thyroidectomy usually stuck in there as well. So um, part of this is the, again, based on the anatomy of the larynx, which things are going to be the um, best at preservation of function as well as oncologic outcome. Sorry, I thought I really liked this one. I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. So the rise of minimally invasive surgery, again, depends on where it's located. You can still get radiation if needed. I'm going to kind of skip through these because, again, I think there's somebody actually talking about this a little bit later this month. Um, but these are some cordectomy procedures. I let the, the fancy laryngologists do these because they're very cool. Um, supercricoid laryngectomy with CHEP or CHIP, um, also uh, reasonable options. Um, first pioneered in France by Oscar Lacoure. Um, can be fairly complex surgery and not everyone is a good candidate. Part of it is like any supraglottic laryngectomy, you have to take into consideration pulmonary function. Um, and also the closure is very important. You have to have at least one working arytenoid for this to be an option. And um, this can be done in a salvage setting, but again, I would really strongly encourage you to, to make sure that their swallowing function and pulmonary function are really intact because these patients do aspirate. Um, and if you're, you know, if the plan is to preserve uh, eating and drinking, you want to make sure that you do this in the safest way possible, especially in patients whose lung function is already compromised. So um, 
I'm going to go through some of the technique for the uh, supracricoid. Essentially, you're detaching a lot of these strap muscles off of the front of the larynx. So this is while the tube is in from above. Um, so you do, some people will start with a tracheostomy um, at the beginning of surgery, although this can kind of affect your, your maneuverability. And so oftentimes, you, even just leaving the tube in um, through the vocal cords at the beginning of the case can be helpful. So you detach the sternohyoid muscles from the hyoid bone and reflect to that first tracheal ring. You can see here, um, everything is retracted laterally as well as the thyroid. So you can see that's all kind of skeletonized there. And you wanna make sure that you protect the recurrent laryngeal nerves because otherwise we're sort of, sort of a moot point. Um, we ligate the superior laryngeal uh, artery and vein with taking care to preserve the nerve. And then rotating larynx, kind of similarly to when you are doing a total laryngectomy, um, dividing those constrictors and skeletonizing, kind of pulling that mucosa off of the thyroid cartilages. And what that does is you wanna get into that submucosal space without violating it. Um, and then you can actually put a stitch in there to hold everything into place. Um, and then again, doing the same thing on the other side. And what that does is it frees the thyroid cartilage off of the front of the larynx. So then the main thing is getting the horizontal and vertical cuts. So you make a wide cricothyrotomy at the level superior border of the anterior cricoid arch, and then retract that membrane. And that's where you wanna take your frozen section. Um, oftentimes, um, and I don't do these very frequently just because we tend to see more advanced cancers here that are not candidates, but um, oftentimes I'll consent them for both the total laryngectomy and the supracricoid. And that way, if heaven forbid, you're, mar you're not able to clear your margins, you're not gonna be doing a, a, an inadequate surgery. Um, all right, so then once you've done that, oh, pardon me. Um, so uh, you use that 11 blade to cut perpendicular to the larynx to kind of look on the inside. Um, and you want to retract the membrane, so the inner, inner side of the cricoid cartilage, take your frozens. Um, you can remove the tube at this point and put it through your cricothyrotomy. That way you can kind of continue on with the rest of the surgery. Um, then the next part is to uh, move to the, um, to the other side, making your cuts. And it depends on whether or not you're going to take your epiglottis or not. In most of these cases, you will be. Um, and making the cut at the superior border thyroid lamina through the thyroid hyoid membrane and epiglottis. And then you can kind of put everything through the midline perpendicular to the larynx, stab through, and take care not to injure your pharyngeal wall. And then you wanna make your horizontal cuts. And again, taking margins the whole time. All right. And then you force it to cut across your vollecula. Let me see if I have a good picture here. And this is kind of what you're looking at when you're making those um, last cuts. So again, you need to leave at least one functioning arytenoid for this to work. Um, the removal of that thyroid cartilage is what allows that um, arytenoid to still function in a sort of different pattern. Um, patients often end up with sort of a froggy-like voice. Um, and then you can see here um, on the right hand side, the cricohyoid, I can never say cricohyoid epiglottopexy uh, or the chip. Um, and what that does is that brings everything closer together in order to assist with function. Now, with regards to the total laryngectomy, many of you have seen these in the past. Um, so, the uh, in order to get this done, um, let's see here, usually you'll have done a neck dissection. Um, there is still some controversy about salvage laryngectomy as to whether or not you need to dissect a neck if there is no pet avidity. Um, and I think this partly depends on the primary side of your tumor. Um, there is, there's been shown to be occult disease within the neck, even when it's pet negative. However, the question of whether or not this is clinically significant disease is, um, is still questionable because if it's sucked into a or sucked into a big area of scar, does that actually affect the um, the outcome? Would it would it have gone any further or grown? Um, part of the reason for that is for salvage laryngectomy, the extent of neck dissection can be predictive of postoperative fistula, which is something we all hate. Um, so anyway, uh, but if you're doing a primary laryngectomy and you're doing your neck dissections, um, typically you'll have released all of your um, all of your attachments 
laterally, and then that's when you go ahead and start making your medial tunnel. Um, you can dive, uh, ligate and, and divide the omohyoid muscles you can see in that picture here. Um, and then what that allows is to kind of be able to sweep your finger between the carotid sheath and the, uh, and the larynx. So um, the way that I do it, and everyone does it slightly the same way, because there are only so many ways to skin a cat if you're into that, um, is divide the strap muscles. Um, so dividing them at the bottom is where I like to kind of get those all divided out, um, which then exposes the thyroid, which um, depending on whether or not there's a tracheostomy tube present, the thyroid can then be divided. And depending on the side of the tumor, um, usually typically one side is saved. Um, once this is complete, you've got that all released down at the bottom, and that also preserves some parathyroids as well. You can start releasing the hyoid uh, bone itself, sort of skeletonizing along that area, taking care to preserve the hypoglossal nerve. Um, and then once that's released, then what I typically will do is release the constrictors along the sides of the larynx, taking care to begin to preserve that piriform sinus mucosa. Um, peeling that off with a freer, um, making sure that you have plenty of mucosa to close with if you're planning on a primary closure. Once that's complete, I usually will put a deaver in the mouth unless there's a significant tongue-based component. Cut right onto the deaver with a bovie until we get to the actual mucosa, in which case I usually will switch over to a scalpel. Um, enter into the larynx is taking a good view of where that original tumor was and then make our cuts accordingly. So we've got some pictures here. So that's a, this is someone with a supraglottic larynx cancer with extension into the postcricoid space, um, which ultimately ended, need, ended up needing a uh, laryngopharyngectomy. This is just sort of images of the um, skeleton, uh, skeletonizing the hyoid bone there. And unfortunately you can't really see that, but this is entering into the larynx. Um, and then this was, um, Actually, sorry, not a, not a learner for injecting. This one's just an extensive tumor. So because of the margins, we put a free flap in there. Now, if you don't have to put a free flap, there are lots of different options for closure. Uh, there's a T closure, a linear closure. Um, you can do continuous sutures. You can do interrupted sutures. You can do Cushing. You can do Canal. You can do a CAT, Battlestar Galactica. There are lots of different ways to do it. The main thing is to make sure that you have a nice watertight closure, if at all possible. Um, personally, I like the T-closure with the little belly button at the bottom, um, and I use a running modified Cushing technique um, in order to do a submucosal stitch and really kind of extend the life of the, um, uh, of the, or the length of the mucosa. Also of import, just to make sure you do a good cricopharyngeal myotomy uh, by putting in one finger into the uh, uh, inlet and using a 15 blade to kind of divide those um, circular muscular fibers in order to, to prevent uh, too much stenosis at the bottom of your repair. Um, I like, I personally like to do a primary TEP on my primary laryngectomies, um, just because a lot of times they can get pretty good function at, at their first post-op follow-up. I had one patient actually driving in the car and accidentally started yelling, at a, someone who cut her off and she realized she could use her TEP uh, without any training. So um, I think it is very uh, fulfilling for a lot of these patients to be able to get some speech at that time. Um, so post-operatively, um, we typically will use a stoma vent with an HME filter. Uh, for those of you who are in COVID heavy areas, um, I would encourage you to have your neck breathers to use an HME. There is an antiviral filter that can be placed within the stoma vent as well as on tracheostomy tubes. Um, our, it's unclear if our patients are at higher risk for COVID-19 infection. Um, however, um, they often tend to have uh, impaired immunity in immune system. So anything we can do to protect them, I think is helpful. So with regards to complications, just like with any surgery, bleeding infection, need for further surgery, percutaneous fistula, which is not fun, difficulty swallowing, which you would think, well, I thought we were doing this so that they could swallow, um, but it can happen particularly in the salvage setting just because of the extent of resection, trouble communicating and pain. Um, so one of the things that we try to do fairly early here is get the patient seen with speech and language pathology to discuss their communication options. 
um, we'll usually get them an electrolarynx in-house so that they can get started using that right away. Um, there are still a lot of patients who prefer not to use an electrolarynx or prefer writing, and that can happen. Um, some patients do really, really well with the TEP, some do terribly. And it's hard to tell until you've actually given it a try. Um, for the salvage laryngectomies, I usually will wait uh, until they're completely healed before giving them a TEP because this gives us an idea if they're gonna have any stenosis at their repair sites. Um, and then of course, pain. So this is an example of a tubed flap. So um, historically, uh, jejunal flaps have been thought to be slightly uh, better from a swallowing standpoint. However, from a voicing standpoint, they could tend to produce a fairly wet voice. Um, and also the, the harvest has a slightly increased risk of morbidity. Nowadays, the um, laparoscopic approaches are very good, um, but they can damage the integrity of the vessels. And so you can have a minimally invasive donor site, but the, um, the vasculature may be compromised when you actually get that piece of jejunum. Whereas the thigh is right there, beautiful vessels, um, can usually put a nice little muscle hug around it to kind of protect the repair. Um, so it's just an example of a hands-free device with a base plate. Um, some of our patients actually don't even necessarily need to push on the, the button. So if, if you have patients who have pretty significant arthritis who still would like to use the TEP, the base plate is a good option. Um, part of it depends on the stoma shape, um, which can be its own lecture in and of itself. Um, but I thought you guys might appreciate this. Let me see if I can get it to work really fast. I would like to share this video. All right, can you guys see this one? Yep, we can see. have any more questions about laryngectomy or laryngectomies, which are people who have had laryngectomy um, and are not at University of Kentucky, feel free to contact us. We have one of the highest rates of larynx cancer in the country. We do about one to three laryngectomies per week. Um, even now, I think we're still doing about one a week. Um, and then we also have a yearly laryngectomy conference for patients who have had laryngectomy. So they get to see kind of all of the um, neat gadgets that are available. And uh, just to remind you guys, you are essential. Even if the Baskin Robbins guy isn't. All right. Any questions I can answer for you guys? All right. If you do have questions, feel free to contact us. I think um, there is a way to do it through the website. Um, and just stay safe. And um, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, we'll hopefully see you soon.